I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and they said with a smile, what a feeling like that is the power of the... I don't know when. And you know we'll have a good time. <laughs> That's where I hope uh, I'm either going to end right before that or right after that with this lecture. So, welcome back. That was shielding electric fields. We're going to start electricity for the rest of the semester, you know. We have four whole lectures you know, before our review, so I figure when I thought this out way back at the beginning, it was tough. Okay, what subjects do I not teach them? Which ones? Uh, they, uh, they use electricity every day. I got to give them something. <laughs> so we won't have a, a specific test just for electricity, but you do have two homework assignments before the end of the semester. Uh, they're a little shorter. I think you'll like that. And uh, I will ask you some questions on the final along with everything else. But clearly we covered forces and motion and whatnot more than electricity. So there'll be more about that than electricity. But you will have some questions on the test. Do you have any um, scheduling? Oh, well, yeah. It's my scatterbrain going three times. In. Do you have any questions about logistics or scheduling or anything at this point? The final, as posted on the university schedule, my calendar, uh, the web assignment calendar, is uh, the 25th, Friday. I didn't choose it. I can't change it. You're stuck. <laughs> it's at, fortunately for you, though, it starts at the same time our class starts right here. So if you just show up Friday like you're going to come to class, you'll be okay. <laughs> you get two hours for it, uh, 1030 to 1230. But yeah, it'll be right here. Same format, same rules, blah, blah, blah. Differences, there'll be more questions because it's more material. You have more time. And uh, there won't be a retake because class is over. So, <laughs> so you're still allowed one sheet of paper if you want. It's just going to be, you've got to choose what you're going to cram on there. Yeah? What uh, time It's 10.30. Yeah, April 25th, Friday. I'm going to grab, I meant to grab a sheet about the lunar eclipse for times. Give me uh, 30 seconds. Yep, I got it right. April 25th, that's Friday. So classes end, uh, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, as you well know. And then uh, just pretend like you're coming to one more class that Friday, and we'll have the exam. But you'll get two hours. Right here, 1030. So yeah, that first total eclipse of a series of four is tonight. It technically begins around 11 tonight, but you probably won't see anything yet. It's, that's when it enters the penumbra, the partial shadow, so you don't see much of an effect. It starts getting cool around 2 in the morning, <laughs> so you can stay up. Uh, it peaks at 1.46 a.m. Yeah. Should be in the south, about 30, 40 degrees up above the horizon in the south. It'll start in the south um, west. No. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Southeast, sorry. Southeast. <laughs> it moves towards the west. So it'll be over here ish. Come up a little, peak, go down. Right in the nice south sky. Should be good if we're not cloudy. And it technically ends at 4.10 in the morning, but the cool part ends around 3.30. So if you were out maybe from midnight to three, you'd see the cool part if you want to try it out. Remember, the, the cool part for me is uh, uh, it's totally blocked. What's blocking the light from getting to the moon? We are, right. So at that, in totality, the sunlight 
can only get around the edges of the earth. That's what's cast in the shadow on the, on the moon so we can see it at all. Light refracts as it changes from the vacuum through, through the edges of our atmosphere. Well, edges of earth, it's our atmosphere. Yeah, it bends. And some of that light diffracts and comes onto uh, the moon. But it's gone through a whole lot of atmosphere. The blue light gets scattered out, leaving the redder side of the spectrum hitting this, the moon. That's why it'll start looking more red as it enters totality. Uh, they're always different depending on our atmospheric conditions, but I expect it to you at least see the tint of red. might not be a deep blood red, but that would be cool. I'm going to go and take pictures. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I feel I'm too close to the mountain, so I'm thinking of going somewhere else and hanging out so that it doesn't obstruct my view for the last bit. Or I guess that would be the first bit. Uh, yeah, it's roughly southeast to southwest, 20 to 40 degrees above the horizon. It's where the whole thing's going to happen, so. I don't want it blocked. I guess at least if you miss it, we got uh, another one coming up in October. So, you ready for electrostatics? You charged up? I know. The, the beauty is, you know a lot of this. I'm going to just fill in some holes and give you some more so you can even more appreciate the beauty of the world around us. So, elect, tw chapter 22 is electrostatics. Statics just means it, it's static. It's not moving. So this is like charges, not flowing. Electrodynamics is when they're moving. And we got circuits. Flow, and that'll be chapter 23. And that's what we'll do. Expose you to some charges and then we'll start moving them. So you can understand this better. Okay. There's two types of charges. I bet you know what they are. Positive. Right. Positive and negative. Very good. What's the source of these? What causes the positive charges? Yeah, that's what I thought. What, how about the easier one? What's the negative charges? Electrons. Does that give you a clue now, maybe, what the positive is? Protons. Yeah, that's right. Protons. What else is in an atom? Neutrons. Do they have a charge? No, we say they're neutral. Hence... Neutron. Neutral. I, I don't really represent it, but I guess you could. <laughs> That's what makes up an atom. You know, you got some protons and neutrons in a nucleus at the center of an atom. And then you got electrons filling a cloud, whizzing around, right? Whatever, well, <laughs> electron. <laughs> well, for most, <laughs> I guess that's not exactly right, is it? <laughs> I'm just trying to de-emphasize that whole orbital thing. We like to picture them like that, but they're not really going around like the Earth goes around the sun. Okay. But anyway, if there are three protons in the nucleus, then there's generally three electrons orbiting. They're balanced. Most, most matter is neutral. But we're composed of all three of these. So when we say something's not charged, like this 2 by 4 what it means is the charges it does have are in balance right now. It's made up of protons and electrons. It's got lots of atoms. But they're in balance. So when we say something is charged, we mean the net effect. If you remove this electron, it goes somewhere, but not, it's not part of the atom. Say it's ejected from the wood. Well, now we would say this is net positive. You see how there's three protons and two electrons? There is, there's going to be more positive charge than negative. The net effect is it's positive. We'd say this is charged positively. 
but that really just means the net effect is positive. There's one more proton than electrons. These have, by the way, the exact same charge. With charge, we use Qs. I generally like lowercase, but you can use big uppercase too. They have the exact same value of charge, even though their mass is huge, hugely different. These are, these are behemoths compared to electrons, but their charge is exactly the same magnitude. We just say this one's positive and this one's negative. And I bet you know how they interact with each other. What do two positives do to each other? What do two negatives do to each other? Yeah, so like charges repel. Two positives repel, two negatives repel. How about a positive and a negative? Opposites. They attract. Opposites attract. See, you guys are smart. <laughs> well, how do we get charged? This is neutral, this is neutral. Full of protons and electrons in balance. This is hair, this is rubber. Your book talks about friction. I like to call it, it's more the separation. When two materials are in contact, anytime they separate, I mean, you can do it like this, they come apart, one material has a tendency to grab electrons more than another material. In this case, the rubber likes to take the electrons from the hair. So we, we would now, you can actually see it, is there the hair sticking to it? <laughs> so we'd say this is charged negatively. It has an excess of electrons, more electrons than protons. So what would this be? Yeah, positive. There's conservation of charge. If the, the, where'd they come from? They came from here. So it's, it has a deficit of electrons by the same amount this has an excess. So yeah, this is charged positively, this is charged negatively. They'd have the same charge, just opposite signs. Let's see, I'm going to put this down on this pivot so it's free to rotate. I'm going to grab a second one. Charge it up. So anytime they separate, we can get charge. So if I bring this negative rod near that negative rod, you expect repulsion. And that it does. Back the other way. They, they repel because they have an excess of electrons and electrons don't like other electrons. They don't play nicely. Well, let's take some different materials. If you take silk and glass, one of them likes electrons more than the other. So we can charge them up. In this case, the silk likes the electrons. So it gets charged negatively, leaving the glass positive. So I'll put that one down here. Grab a second one. Anybody heard of the triboelectric series? Oh, that's just a list that defines materials. Who likes electrons more than another? So if you get two materials that are really far apart on that series, one that really likes electrons and one that really wants to give them up, and you rub those together, you can separate charge more effectively. So this is positive. That's positive. I expect repulsion. Here we go. But I expect attraction over here. Ah, it works. Uh, you always worry, you know, sometimes. <laughs> there we go. So opposites attract, likes repel. You, you guys uh, remember your chemistry on the... Oh, yes, Ron. If I leave them there, uh, ideally, yeah, it holds that excess or deficit of electrons indefinitely. Yeah. Now, we are doing something to it, though. We're going to learn how charge can start to move. There's conductors and insulators. And you know this, too. Conductors let charges flow on them. Electricity conducts. It can move around, like metals. They're a popular metal. Why? Because those electrons aren't really fixed to any given atom. They're free to move around. That's how they reflect light, because it didn't get transmitted through, because they're not connected. It also allowed heat to conduct really well, because those electrons are free. Same with, with charge. Those electrons are free to move around in metals, and so they make good conductors. Insulators don't. <laughs> the electrons are, are bound to the individual atoms, 
So they can wiggle and have energy, but it doesn't allow it to move. So you put charge on an insulator, like these, glass and rubber or insulators. Wherever I, the, I put that excess charge or deficit, that's where it's sustaining. It's not spreading out. But if we could bring something near those that's conductive, well, then that charge where you touch could come off, right? Or if there's a deficit, I'm touching ground, I'm a conductor, that there's a deficit of electrons in the glass. If I touch it right here, the electrons can come from me to it and re-neutralize it. It become neutral again. The, those would probably stay forever except for the water vapor in the air, humidity. That's why Utah is great for electrostatic demos. Yeah, my colleagues are envious. <laughs> they often have to like keep these things in uh, sealed cases to keep them dry. Sometimes I have to hit these with blow dryers because water is a conductor of electricity. And so if water vapor comes by, it can allow charge to transfer and make these neutral again. So eventually that's why they would lose their charge. Electric charge is, in fact, everywhere. Because it makes up everything. Protons and electrons. Now, they're generally in balance, and so most things are neutral. We don't notice an effect until we separate charges and cause an excess or deficit. That's what electricity is all about. We're, we separate the charges and make, have more electrons here than here, or we rub things together. And then we can cause charges to move because they want to go back to being neutral in essence. You could think of it, yeah. That, that kind of inertia would work. They want to be neutral because if you have an excess of electrons and you bring them near some protons, opposites attract. Well, what if it attracted too many protons? Well, now it would be net positive, wouldn't it? That would want to attract more electrons. So it's going to want to go to a resting state where it's neutral, in balance. By the way, when you uh, take an electron away, whoosh, some of you know, we would call this an ion. Atoms that are, uh, have an excess or deficit of electrons are ions. This would be a positive ion. Do you see why? because there's more protons than electrons. This would have a net charge of positive, plus one. Take another one away, it'd be plus two. And vice versa. If it gained more electrons, it'd be minus one or minus two. So you probably heard the terms ionizing something. That's just stripping it of electrons or adding more, making it net positive or negative. And once it becomes an ion, it now has a net charge, it's more conductive. So air is generally, uh, it's full of these. It's full of it. I'm full of it. But I'm in balance. The air is in balance. It's not charged. If you ionize the air, you do this, and it can become conductive. There can be a path for it. Lightning, whoosh, or, or other things. Back to these materials. I find it fascinating, so I'm telling you. <laughs> Your uh, periodic table, envision it. On the right-hand side, because some of you I know covered this, those are almost full. Their outer shell of electrons is almost full. They need a few more to be full and happy. That's their, they're at a higher energy state. Actually, a lower energy state, sorry. And they like that. So materials on the right hand side of the periodic table tend to want to grab electrons more. And things on the left tend to give them up because they only have a couple. So they got a lot to gain before they'd be full, have a full outer shell. So if they just gave up a couple, they could go back to their next shell that's full ah, and they're happy and content. So these things tend to give them up and become positive and these, tends, these tend to grab them and become more negative. Here's an example of a conductor and an insulator. That's, well, I'm just making sure it's still charged. I'm going to transfer it to this. And there's ways to ch transfer charge. Direct contact is obvious. 
So metal's a conductor. I think you know that. <laughs> and I just told you. So if I touch it, think some charge went to the conductor. Some of that excess charge. So this is a little less charge now because some of it moved on to there. Not very much, huh? Because this is an insulator. Only the charge that was touching was able to move. Charge over here can't flow in an insulator, so it's still stuck over here. So if I do this, kind of scrape it off, make more points of contact, now I've essentially discharged this. It's back to neutral. They're in balance. This has an excess of electrons. They travel down. They don't like each other, so they spread out. Got on the needle. The needle doesn't like the electrons on the body, and so it repels, pushes it away. This is called an electroscope, and you can use it. The bottom is insulated from the top, so I can touch the bottom. And how far it goes over it gives you an indicator of how much charge is on there. There's a force between charges, this attraction and repulsion. And we call that the Coulomb force. I'll write it on the board in a moment. Coulomb force. If I touch it, this has an excess of electrons. I'll give them a path, a conductive path to ground. So they come off. This is neutral again. Charge it back up. So here's a metal rod. I'll do that way. If I touch it, same thing. Charge it back up. Here's plastic. Should be an insulator. Ta-da! So sure, some of the charge is transferred to right there, but it can't move through the insulator, so it doesn't discharge enough to see an effect. Okay, wood. Tell me what'll happen. Conductor or insulator? Most of you said insulator. Somewhere in between, isn't it? Wood is often used as an insulator. However, it can conduct a little bit, especially on the surface if it's wet or oily. And high voltage stuff would go across. I wouldn't trust my life to insulating myself with a higher voltage on wood. But you can see it discharges it a little. So this is somewhere in between. Things that are in between are called semiconductors because they're in between. Semi, <laughs> half an insulator, half a conductor. Uh, wood is generally a good insulator. But just realize if you're trusting your life to it, I wouldn't. <laughs> Can conduct, especially if it's moist. All right. This is fun. I like did that, did that, did that. Let's write the Coulomb's Law, because this is all about forces. We know all about forces. It's a guy's last name of Coulomb, if you hadn't figured that out. <laughs> There's a force. And it is proportional to the amount of charge you have. You remember how the Earth's really big, so it attracts us with a big force because it has lots of mass. The analogy is the same here. If you have more charge, more mass, more charge, you get a bigger force. So it's proportional to uh, the charge. There's got to be two, right? Because forces are interactions between two things. All forces come in pairs. What law is that? Yeah, at least you said Newton. <laughs> it's the third. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I prefer all forces come in pairs. So if you have two charges, they exert forces on each other because of their charge. And if they have more charge, the force will be bigger. But realize, if you have a plus charge and another plus charge, attract or repel? Repel. So this charge, charge number two, feels a force on it. Due to one. One on two. This guy sees this charge, charge number one, and gets repelled away. By how much force? We're getting to it. This F. But what happens to this guy? He feels a force. And it's two on one. He feels a force because of number two. And so... For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. All forces come in pairs. So you better get it right. How does this force compare to this force in magnitude? 
They're the same. Even if this was like 200 Q and this was just 1 Q, you know, in magnitude. The force between them is the same. Remember our mosquito hitting a big diesel truck? <laughs> the force on the mosquito is the same as the mosquito on the glass, on the windshield. The force is the same. That's what Coulomb's law is telling us here. Now, how one will be affected more than the other, just like with mass. For me, my analogy is Q, the, the amount of charge is kind of like mass. So when you get confused, think back to what you do know with masses. All right. Now, with gravity, you know, the force of gravity using masses, if we get farther apart, the gravitational force between us decreases. You know, if we go out into space, there's a lot less force of gravity on us because we're not as close to the mass of the Earth. So distance affects this too. And it is a squared term. And I'll get to that. There's a constant of proportionality. Force is proportional to the charge. You increase the charge, the force goes up. But if you separate and get farther apart, the force goes down. Exactly how much, there's a constant called Boltzmann's constant. It's a huge number. That tells us the forces are very big between charges. So this is just a constant that's really big that makes this equal, exactly equal. It tells us this electrostatic force is big. Now this square, remember we had a square before in kinetic energy? So if you double this distance, we take this and move it out to here, how does the force change? By a factor of what? We're twice as far away, so D got bigger, the force should go down, but how much? Four times, very good. Because the distance is now twice as far, squared. So that's 4D. squared. <laughs> so it, and that's on the denominator. So the force is a fourth less or four times weaker. What if we were three times as far away? It'd be nine times the strength. What if we change this to negative? Does that change the force? Right, force is a, is a vector. It doesn't change the magnitude because a positive charge and a negative charge are the same charge. They're the same Q value. So the magnitude of this does not change. But yeah, if uh, it's going the other direction, you throw in the minus sign, right? Whether you're attracting or repulsing. Usually attracting is positive and repelling is negative. But they can go both ways. That's different than gravity, isn't it? Gravity is only attracting. That's why it's positive. We don't have negative gravity. But you can have a negative electrostatic force. This uh, squared term is called the inverse square law. And it's true with gravity. It's, this is the same relationship. We did not cover that chapter. Uh, let me, right here. But the force due to gravity was due to a constant, just like this. Mass 1, mass 2, and their distance squared. It looks exactly the same. So it's an inverse square law for gravity, it, it, the force, and electrostatics. This is to help you kind of visualize that. If this were, were a charge at this point, then the force over here is represented by one square. You double the distance and get twice as far away. See how there's four squares? You can think of this as a light bulb if you want. The light here is concentrated in one square. The light here has to be spread out over four squares. So it's four times the strength. And if you're three times as far away, see there's nine squares. That's the inverse square law. And it's true for electricity, forces between charges, as well as forces between masses. In gravity, this constant is really small because the gravitational force between masses is relatively really weak. 
This constant is huge. And so the forces between charges is huge. The electrostatic force is billions of times stronger than the gravitational force. Billions generically, not exactly. <laughs> Okay, so we got these forces. These, by the way, are the forces that hold everything together. They hold the atom together, positives and negatives. That's, so that's ultimately, when you go microscopically down, that's the forces holding this together. And why my hand cannot go through the table? You ever wonder that? You know, there's, there's, there's bonds there, right? And we, we can't break them. What's causing those bonds? Electrostatic forces. It's Coulomb's law, holding things together. That's why you can't just go through it. <laughs> I think that's neat. There's another way to transfer charge. This one's a little more confusing. Let's do it with our electroscope here. Let's discharge it. So you can charge by conduction. That's where you make direct contact. It's the same we had with heat, conduction. It's when you're in contact. That's like rubbing this. Direct contact, it's move. That should make sense. But, let me charge this up and bring it near the electroscope. I'm not going to touch it. So there's no way any charge from this can jump to there. But look what happens. What's going on? Why is that moving? And then it goes back to normal. I'm influencing the charges in the electroscope. If this is negative, which it is, what's it do to the uh, negative charges in the, in the metal? It repels them. So they, kinda, they shift. This is a, a conductor, so they, they move farther away from this. What's that leave closer to it? The positive sides are attracted, and now they're closer. And that distance really matters, doesn't it? So both charges are still there. This is still neutral because they're balanced. But we've shifted and repositioned the charges. The negatives are farther away. The positives are closer. And so there's a bigger force of attraction between the positives and the negative. If I do that, I can touch down here where the negatives are, take them away. And then I'm going to remove the wand, and it stays charged. I removed some of those excess electrons that were repelled away. So now it's a deficit of electrons. It's positive. It's net positive. Let's see that. Our glass got charged up positively. So let's charge this up again. So if this is positive and that's positive, we should see attraction or repulsion. So as I bring it near, yep, see how it goes down? It repels it away. See it slow down? And if I bring negative near it, that's positive. This is negative. We should see it attract. Yep. So that's called charging by induction. Induction. I-N. So you have charging by conduction with direct contact. That charges up the same as it is. If this is negative and you, you touch it, you're negative. But charging by induction charges it up oppositely. So we brought uh, a negative rod near the electroscope and charged it up positively. I have a little uh, animation to show you for this. So here are uh, two spheres. They're neutral. Can you see that there's a balance of positive and negative charges there? You could count them up. I think it works. They're neutral. But there's a, a negative rod coming nearby. That's going to come near the rod over here. What will it do to the charges in the spheres? The, right. It, the rod's negative, so the negatives in the spheres should shift away from it. This is called polarization. We had that with waves how you polarize something in one direction. 
Well, by re repositioning the positives and negatives, they kind of become aligned in a certain axis. So this is called polarization too. Charging by induction works because you can polarize things. These shift. So I hit the little play. The rod comes near. See them shift? Let's do it again. Rod comes near. The electrons shift to the right. They're repelled. If, while they're repelled, you separate the charges. That's like me touching. You can see what happens. The rod comes near. They shift. Now separate. Whoosh. Hey, we separated while more of the negative charges were on the right side. So look at the spheres now. They're charged. I was charging by induction. The right sphere has more negatives, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah. It's got more negatives than positives, so it's negative. And the one on the left has more positives than negatives, so it's positive. Yeah, this is a little cute animation. The protons would shift too. However, protons are way more massive than electrons, so it's less effective. They wouldn't move as much, just like Newton's second law. But also, um, the electrons are more free to move in a conductor, so that's what moves more. Let's see what happens in an in. Oh, yeah. What's reversed polarity? Reversed polarity? That's uh, often when. It's basically this. If you've got positives on, on one side and negatives on the other, or a net effect, reverse polarity is just switching that. Now you have more positives on this side than you did on that side. It's usually referred to with a battery because you have a positive and negative side. Reverse polarity would be plugging it in the other way. Uh, here's another one with an insulator. This is an insulating ball. It's a pith ball. Or you can think of it as a piece of glass. Glass is a good insulator. Think about that one. I, I did. Glass was transparent, wasn't it? Metals are reflective. Metals have the free electrons. So they take it and they, they absorb the uh, photons of light, but they don't transmit it through it because they're not really attached. That's what makes them good conductors. Glass resonated though, right? Or it, it resonated with infrared and ultraviolet, but visible light passed right through it. It doesn't resonate. That's because the electrons are really bound and stuck. So in that case, they're not free to move. It makes it a really poor conductor. There is a connection between these. So we bring the uh, charged rod that's negative near the neutral insulator, and we'll see what happens. So at first, it's brought near it. I wish I could pause this. It's brought near it, and you can see them get polarized in the yellow ball. You see the electrons move to the left? They shift. Because it's an insulator, they're not free to just move wee willy-nilly. They just kind of shift. We still say they're polarized. So the, there's a, the, the center of the charge shifts, and they make it effectively as if positives and negatives were in different positions. And Coulomb's law is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So whatever's closer, that force is going to be stronger than whatever's farther away. And so you see the insulator get attracted to the rod. As it polarizes, oh look, there's attraction, the positives and the negatives. Then the rod actually touches the ball, doesn't it? Well, now we're in contact. Some of those charges can transfer through conduction. Do you see the charges from the rod move to the insulator? Now the insulator has more electrons than it did initially. It's charged negative. Well, the, rod, the rod's negative. They repel. Okay. So, I want to do this one more time. Because it tends to confuse folks. So those of you that think you got it, good. Be happy. <laughs> we bring negative charges near the electroscope. It polarizes the charges, but we're still, it's still neutral. If I ground this end, I can remove some of those charges over here. And there's more negatives on this side than there are positives because I polarized it. So I touch the bottom. Remove the rod. They reposition, but it has less electrons now. I took them away, so it's net positive. That's charging by induction. 
It was opposite than the rod. This rod still has the same amount of charge it started with because none of it's actually been transferred to the electroscope. That's charging by induction. Conduction, physical contact. Now this is not charged because they moved. You've done this before, I'm sure. You blow up a balloon. How many rubbed a balloon on your hair? I like the long skinny balloons. So in theory, this should be neutral. They're in balance. Let's see. I don't know. Uh, mostly. <laughs> As you inflate it, it rubs with the air. But this works wonderfully. Let's separate charges. This becomes negative. What's it going to do to the negatives on the door? It repels them. We've polarized the wood. It's attracted to the positives that are closer to it. That force is stronger. So while it's near, it's polarizing the charges in the wood and it attracts to it. Works great. And you don't have to mess your hair up that way. You just, you know, go get some animal fur. My daughter doesn't like this. I didn't kill the animal. <laughs> so, here's some wood. It's got charges, but they're in balance, so it's neutral. Let's polarize the wood charges, right? Negative rod, bring it near the wood, and it attracts them. You can move a whole two by four with this Coulombic force. I know, you don't all have wood and fur, so here you go. You can do it with a balloon. You can take an oven bag and a plastic flamingo. Rub them together, you separate charges. Now, this has an excess of electrons, it's negative. So I bring it near the wood. It polarizes it, and sure enough, it starts attracting the positives in the wood, and we can move the whole two by four until it falls off. Sometimes I'll do a party trick. You can do this on, on, your, on your dates. You might not get a second one, but it depends on what the hell what they think. Take a coin. Balance it. There we go. I'm going to take a match. Now see, I have these in Ziplocs so they don't absorb moisture. Because if they get too wet, they don't hold charge because water is a conductor. I want them to be nice and insulating. So I've kept these in Ziplocs to hopefully so this will work. I'm going to balance this on top of the uh, coin. And I'm going to cover it with the glass. And then you can, like, you know, bet your friends or something. Can you knock the match off the coin without touching it? You can't touch the glass. You can't bang the table. How would you get the match off? It, you can't blow on it because it's blocked. It's not magnetic. Gravity is too weak. So you remember your old physics class and you go, hey, what about that electrostatic force? Would that do something? What if I charge this up and bring it near the match? Will this force go through glass? It appears not to. It's supposed to. <laughs> well, let's try this. This has more charge. Yeah, this, uh, this force should go through glass. So if this uh, cup is too oily, dirty, or the match got too wet, it's not holding the charge. Aw. Boo!
So you go back to your control. Let's see, that's working. Okay, we know the balloon's charged. So it should have the same effect on the match. Oh, I saw it. At least move. Bummer. Sometimes I'll like, all I do is just get close and the thing goes bloop. Other times I can spin it around. And the disappointing times are like this when it does absolutely nothing and you guys are all disappointed. I will clean it, of course, try it next time if this doesn't work. Oh! Center mass. Got to find the center mass and support it, right? Here we go. <laughs> there. Oh, look at that. It moved. Yay. <laughs> I'll get a new match. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, polarizing and whatnot. So we got our forces, we got the charges, we know what they do. Charges have electric field. Where are we at? That's a good stopping point. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. So the only way a charge leaves that rod is when you touch, it hasn't touched. If there's an ele electrical path, a conductive path, so that charge can leave. It will, even though it's not if there's a path. Oh. Like before you said to discharge, yeah, like it would need water in the air to come off, or me touching it, yeah. Okay. Say I charge this up. If I touch right here, the charge over here won't just <laughs> and come off. But I mean the induction. Oh, the induction. Yeah, that was the rod. This is charged, bring it near, do the thing. So We've just repositioned the charges over here so that there's more on one side than the other of one type. But nothing's transferring. When, when I touch it, that excess of electrons left, leaving it net positive. But I haven't removed any of the charges on here. So then when I come away, they reposition and are, and are no longer neutral. So the induction's kind of like a magnet? Or? You can think of the influence. Magnets influence okay. the stuff inside. These, that's a magnetic force. These are electrical forces through Coulomb's law. Yeah. There was a hand over here. So if you are smashing that countertop with like a sledgehammer, are you breaking the electrical force? Y yes. When you break something like this, what's holding it together are the atomic and molecular bonds. And all bonding pretty much can be boiled down to electrostatic forces between protons and electrons. You know, covalent bonding, the sharing, I mean, it's all electrical. So in order to break those bonds, yes, you're overcoming an electrostatic force, in essence. Yep. Water is already polarized. Okay, there's your, here's your homework. <laughs> there's a the chalk. 60 seconds. You got oxygen and hydrogen. It's already naturally kind of polarized. Oxygen uh, becomes negative. Hydrogens become positive because they only have one electron. It's shared with the oxygen. So it's like it doesn't have it as often. So it's more positive. But look, see how they're arranged? This side is more positive than this side. So if you charge up a balloon or a comb, try it on your faucet. Make it drip a little bit, you know, a little stream coming down. Not a raging river, a stream, <laughs> so it's not that massive. Bring your charged object near it slowly. You ought to see this bend. It should attract to your charged object because this is already polarized. Until this gets wet, then that'll discharge it. You'll have to dry it off and try it again. But you can bend water because it's already polarized. Any other questions? All right, have a good day.